Let's get into God's word for today. Today's title or today's message is about God doing mighty miracles when we pray. God does mighty miracles when we pray. Last week, we talked about um, kind of a, a, a plan that, that God does miracles when we obey and walk in faith. So we talked about our part in being involved in mighty miracles. We want to talk about it just a little bit more today, and we want to look a little bit more closely at the story where this widow's son was raised to life in 1 Kings chapter 17. I read it to you last week, but this week we're going to look at it just a little bit more closely. The title for our sermon series came from the scripture that you saw in the sermon bumper from the book of James, where it says that Elijah was a person like you or me, and he prayed, and it did not rain for three and a half years on the earth, and then he prayed again, and there was rain on the earth. That little scripture passage begins with a question. It says, is anyone among you in trouble? Is anyone in trouble? Hey, listen, there are people in this room today, you'd say, yeah, I'm in trouble. (laughs) Maybe you didn't cause the trouble. Maybe you're not in trouble because you did something wrong. How many of you remember being in trouble when you were a child? That's no fun, right? Like, I got in trouble. I remember one time, I was like, I'm not cleaning my room. And I ran off into the woods to go play. And uh, I was out hiding because I wasn't going to clean my room. I, I mean, I'd rather waste time than clean my room. Anybody with me? You been there? Did you guys ever do that when you were a little kid? So I'm out in the woods hiding and just, you know, doing my own thing, thinking, you know, mom's at, ha- at the house and uh, we'll see what happens. She'll forget about telling me to clean my room later. And like out of nowhere, she snuck up on me in the woods and she spanked me by surprise, because she found me out there wasting time rather than cleaning my room. I mean, I was in trouble, but that's because I was in trouble, right? Like, I did that to myself in many ways. But sometimes we're in trouble, and it's not because we did anything wrong. I mean, life is filled with trouble, isn't it? And we just face trouble. I mean, we deal with trouble. Uh, We deal with heartache. We deal with grief. Uh, We deal with the fact that things go wrong. And here is this woman who is living north of Israel in the land of Sidon in this little town of idol worshipers. And this man of God from Israel comes north out of his nation to stay with her because God said, if you'll go to this widow at Zarephath, I'll provide for you there. Why would God provide through a widow who has no job and no means, no husband to support her? God provided through this poor lady who was struggling to take care of her only son. But yet God provided through her. God said, go stay with her. You'll find her at the city gate. And and he found this widow picking up some sticks. Why is she picking up sticks? She said, I'm going to go home and build a fire. Hello. I'm going to go home and build a fire. I'm going to break some bread out of the last handful of meal and oil that I have. I'm going to give it to my son, and then we will die. Boy, that's not a very good plan, is it? That's not a good plan for a day. I'm going to make my last little meal, and then I'm going to die. But Elijah said, make a a small cake for me first and bring it to me, and you'll find that the word of the Lord is this, the meal will not run out and the oil will not run dry. And so for a long time, God has been providing for Elijah in the midst of a drought through this miraculous provision of oil and flour in this woman's jar and container in her home. And they've been eating this miraculous food for quite some time. And that's where the story picks up. They're experiencing this amazing daily miracle of God's provision. But 1 Kings 17 verse 17 says this, sometime later... The son of the woman who owned the house became ill. That's trouble. He grew worse and worse. That's trouble. And then he stopped breathing. That's bad trouble. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? She's mad. She's upset. Verse 19 says, give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him up to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him on his bed. 
Then he cried out to the Lord. Everybody say cried. He cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room of the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is from your mouth, or the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth, is truth. God did a mighty miracle right there, didn't he? This boy became sick. He grew worse and worse until he stopped breathing. And then God raised that boy back to life. There are only a few places in the Bible where God raises someone back to life from the dead. The widow's son at Nain was raised to life in Jesus' ministry. Jairus' daughter was raised back to life in Jesus' ministry. Eutychus was raised from the dead after falling out of a third-story window because Paul preached on and on and on into the night. And poor Eutychus, he just got sleepy, and he fell out the window and landed on the ground three stories below and died. But when Paul ran down, he stretched out his body on Eutychus and prayed, and that boy's life was returned to him as well. That young man was raised from the dead. It's interesting to me that of the few cases where someone's raised from the dead in the Old Testament, three of them are with Elijah and Elisha. Three of them are in the ministry of just two people. That's a big deal. And Elijah is experiencing this kind of in a new way. Elisha asked for a double portion, didn't he? And so I think Elisha thought, boy, if Elijah experienced someone being raised from the dead, I'm going to experience someone being raised from the dead in the course of ministry, and he did. It's an amazing miracle. It's an unusual miracle. I wish that every time someone died, they'd be raised from the dead. But that's not the case, is it? We face trouble. We face grief. We face difficulty. Many of us have prayed for someone to be healed, and God called them home to their heavenly reward. Many times we prayed for someone to receive a miracle of healing, and rather than receiving a miracle of healing, maybe they received help for healing, and they had to go through a process. And it was difficult. Maybe it was painful. Maybe it included surgery, and and with the help of healing hands and, and healing knowledge, they were finally brought to wholeness. But it caused a great deal of trouble, a great deal of rehab, maybe some time in the nursing home, maybe some time of having to overcome some difficulty. We'd all like to experience just that immediate, miraculous, powerful miracle that just goes above and beyond and makes life easy. Don't we all want that? And I believe that there are times that God wants to give us that, and I believe that it may be that God wants to do that more often than we think, but we've got to prepare ourselves to experience mighty miracles. We need to prepare ourselves to experience mighty miracles. And there are some some things that we ought to do. There are some things that we could develop in us to make us ready for that mighty miracle. I think there are some miracles that God hasn't done through me or in me or with me because I wasn't ready to really handle the miracle that God could have sent. And so I want to talk to you about some things that will help us see mighty miracles in our life. First of all, let me just say this as just a backdrop. If you're going to see mighty miracles in your life, it's probably because your life has mighty problems. Like, big miracles come with big problems, but most of us would rather not have problems. How many of you would agree with that? And some of you are like, listen, God, I'd love to see mighty miracles, but how about you give me the mighty miracle of an easy life? (laughs) How many of you say amen to that? I just like that. Lord, sometimes... And God knows sometimes we just need some peace, right? Sometimes we just need some peace. There are other times that we find ourselves in trouble, and we're going to have to fight through that trouble. We're going to have to fight for a mighty miracle, and there's no other option than to fight for a mighty miracle. 
And so let's look at some ways that we can fight for a mighty miracle. Number one, if we want to see mighty miracles, if we're going to fight for a mighty miracle in our time of trouble, we've got to overcome a negative spirit. We've got to overcome a negative spirit. This woman, her, she's been receiving this wonderful miracle daily, a provision of food, but then sometime later, her son becomes ill. He's growing worse and worse. Don't you think that Elijah was probably praying for that boy? And the whole time he's praying for that boy, he's getting worse and worse. Elijah could have had a negative spirit at that point, couldn't he? Because Elijah was a man of prayer. Elijah was a man who had faith in God. I think he was probably praying for that boy, but the boy grew worse and worse, and then finally, it got so bad, he passes. He stops breathing. There's no sign of life in him anymore. That would have been an opportunity for Elijah to have a negative spirit, and we see that this mom who is grieving, she does very quickly develop that negative spirit. It's her first response. It's her emotional response. It's her knee-jerk response that she is negative. Sometime later, the woman who owned the house had the son who becomes ill, and she says, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin, and did you come to kill my son? She had that negative spirit. Mom was mad. Mom was mad. How many of you have had bad things happen in your life, and you got mad? I've gotten mad about things a lot smaller than this situation. I mean, I will be working on my house, and I can't get a certain screw to pull out, and I'll get mad. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or I will be putting the plumbing together underneath the sink, and I can't get all the pieces to fit together, and I get mad. And then I go to Lowe's. And that poor guy in aisle 13, I mean, his job is just to keep all the plumbing stuff straight. You know, this goes in this box, this goes in this box, this goes in this box, and I come stomping down the aisle, and I'm mad because I've got this little thing that's not working right underneath my sink. And he's like, oh no, here comes one of these home fix-it guys who doesn't know what he's doing, and he's mad, and he's probably going to take it out on me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody been there? Oh, yeah. It's not just home fix-it repairs. Sometimes it's things a, a lot more complicated. But even something so simple as that can cause us to just dive into that negative spirit. If you want to see a mighty miracle from God, there's no place for a negative spirit. Sure, you may be mad, but there's got to be a point at which you get done with mad and say, okay, God, I need you to talk to me about the way I'm supposed to feel right now. I need you to help me get control of my mind. I need you, by the power of your spirit, to help me get control of my emotions. Because they're running off the rails like crazy because I'm mad. Mom was not only mad, she was blaming others in that moment of a critical spirit. She said, did you come here to kill my son? Elijah, you did this. This is because of you. Well, hang on a second. Let's just think logically. Some time ago, your plan was to pick up sticks, bake bread, and then let your son die. He would have died a long time ago if Elijah hadn't been here, and she would have died too. They would have starved to death long before this occurrence. But all that miracle, all that good stuff from God fades into oblivion when she is facing this new trouble and now she's blaming others. Listen, blaming others is not going to fix the situation. Blaming others will not fix the situation. Blaming others will not heal you of your grief. Blaming others will not heal you of your grief. Blaming others will not fix the problem that you find yourself in right now. Blaming others will not build your faith in the midst of the trouble that you're facing right now. Can I tell you one thing? It's, this isn't, this isn't, isn't even in my notes. Blaming others will not bring you joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah tells us. But blaming others won't bring you joy. Blaming others 
will not mend your anger. A lot of times people have bad things to happen to them, and so they think, well, you know what will bring healing is this lawsuit and the money that I'm going to get because I have a just and valid case. You have a just and valid case, you're going to win that lawsuit, and you're going to get some cash for it. But can I remind you that even if you win and you get the cash, that will not heal anger. There's no amount of money somebody's going to give you to heal a broken heart. There's no amount of money that someone's going to give you that's going to make bitterness go away. There's no amount of money that somebody's going to pay you, and there's no amount of, of help from God that, uh, that is tangible, a car, a house, funds, bank account, those tangible blessings, those things that you may be longing for in a moment of anger, those things are not going to take away the words that are still circling in your mind that hurt so bad that someone else spoke to you. Only God can heal the anger. Only God can heal the bitterness. Only God can mend the broken heart. Only God can walk with you through all of your grief after you've lost someone that you love. Is everybody with me today? And this lady, in this moment, at this second, she was blaming others. This mom was also wrestling with shame. So she's been experiencing the miracle of like bread and oil every day, God's provision in her home. But then when something bad happens, she immediately thinks, this happened because I didn't obey God before. This happened because I've been wrong. And I think sometimes we're going through bad times in our life and we're like, oh, you know what? This is happening to me because I did this to that person. I did that to myself. I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway and now God is going to get me back. And I think maybe she was thinking that. She felt some shame for something that happened in her past. Maybe it was idol worship. Who knows what it was? The Bible doesn't tell us what it was. But she felt shame for her sin. And the devil, in this moment of grief and pain and deep, huge loss in her life, in this moment, the devil used that opportunity to accuse her of all that she had done wrong in the past. Or at least something that she had done wrong in her past. When bad things happen, the devil is always going to use that opportunity to try to accuse you. In the book of Job, we're introduced to the devil, and we're given a name. And in Job, it says, the Satan. In Hebrew, it, there's, a definite, there's an article before his name. In English, it just says, Satan came before the Lord. In Hebrew, it's the Satan, because the name Satan means accuser. That's what the name Satan means in Hebrew. The accuser came before God. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? And he's like, no, nah, Job only serves you because you're good to him. Take away all his blessings and he'll curse you to your face. What was the devil doing? What was Satan doing? He was doing what his name implies. He was accusing God's people and I think in this moment, here's this woman, she's experienced the goodness of God, the provision of God, the presence of God through Elijah in her home, and now she experiences a loss, and the devil gets into her mind, Satan, the accuser, gets into her mind and says, this is happening to you because you're not good enough. This is happening to you because God doesn't forgive. He always remembers, and he'll get you back. I mean, that's what the devil will say. Is everybody with me today? And I want to encourage you today that the devil, Satan, the accuser, he's a liar. Jesus said that he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus said that when he speaks, he lies, which is his native language. It's his way of talking. It's the words that he uses. He is a liar, and you need to recognize when the devil is lying to you or when the accuser is accusing you in the midst of your trouble so that you can stand up in faith and say, I'm going to believe God for a mighty miracle. So number one, mom was mad. Number two, 
mom felt shame because she was giving in to the accusations of the devil. And then thirdly, I want you to see that mom was blaming others in that situation. Three things that we see in that negative spirit. And she had to overcome that. She needed to overcome that, and God helped her to overcome. Aren't you grateful that God helps us even when we have a negative spirit? Aren't you grateful for that? I mean, my spirit, my attitude is not right all the time, but even in the midst of those moments where my spirit and my attitude is not right, God can work, God can help, and I want to respond appropriately when he's helping me to overcome a negative spirit. Amen? Amen. I want to respond to that. I'm not going to live in that negative spirit. I will have a spirit of faith in God within me. I will have a spirit of positivity within me. Number two, overcome a negative spirit. Cultivate, number two, a bold spirit. Cultivate a bold spirit. So Elijah said to the woman, give me your son. Can you imagine? There's this woman whose son has just died, and he's like, let me take him. I mean, the Bible doesn't say this, but... I would imagine you'd have to peel that kid out of her arms. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I mean, I'm not letting go of my son. She just blamed him. Have you come here to kill my son? She just blamed him of bringing this on the family, on the household. And yet, Elijah's like, well, give him to me. And for whatever reason, she acquiesced and gave him the boy. Elijah got bold and took action. And if we want to experience mighty miracles, we've got to cultivate a bold spirit. What does it mean to cultivate something? Well, it's like you turn up the soil, you mix up the soil, you dig into the soil, you turn the soil over so that the nutrients of the soil get air, so that the nutrients of the soil will do their work and grow something great, so that it will be fertile soil that will grow a plant in it. That's what cultivation is. And we've got to cultivate a bold spirit. It's not something that just comes upon us accidentally. It's something that we have to develop many times and develop it even in the worst of times. Like when the soil is most hard and most frustrated and most angry or most bitter, that's where we need to say, hey God, I need you to cultivate the boldness that needs to be in me spiritually and you need to cultivate the soil of my life. So he took action. He took action and took the boy up to his upper room. And then the second thing he did is he cried out to the Lord. He noticed that, that the writer of Scripture uses the word cried out to the Lord. And I don't think that means like crying like he was weeping. It means like he shouted. It's like crying out to someone across the football field. Hey, it's coming! It's that kind of cry. And I think that when Elijah took that boy up to that upper room and he began to cry out to the Lord, the woman downstairs, that mom who's probably weeping, heard the man of God crying out to God, praying to God with a loud petition to the Lord. The book of Hebrews says this about Jesus, that Jesus in his earthly life prayed to the Father with loud cries and petitions. With loud cries and petitions. You want to be more like Jesus? Then do what Hebrews said Jesus did and learn to pray out loud and learn that there are some times where you need to pray loud. There are times you can pray quietly. We mentioned Hannah during the baby dedication today. Hannah stood before the Lord full of emotion, weeping in God's presence, but the Bible says she prayed in her heart. But she prayed with such emotion that while she was praying in her heart, Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk. That's how passionate her prayer was, even while she prayed in her heart. There are other times in Scripture where people pray out loud. And I encourage you to become a person who prays out loud. Use your voice. And there are some times where you need to lift up a loud cry to the Lord. Some of you are like, Pastor, why do you play music during prayer time? And why is the music sometimes kind of loud when we're up here trying to pray? Can I tell you why I do that on purpose? I do that on purpose so that you will not be afraid to pray loud. Because if I have quiet music, you'll make quiet prayers. But if I turn the music up, you'll begin to cry out to God. And you won't be ashamed to do it. I wish that we would become a people who would cry out to God when there's no music. 
I wish that on Wednesday night, if I just say to the church when it's time to pray at Wednesday prayer time, if I say, guys, let's lift our voices and pray to God, there'd just be a chorus of voices raised up in the room as people just begin to pray out loud all across the place without shame, without hindrance, without uh, any kind of uh, concern for what anybody else thinks about you. I'm just going to lift up my voice, and I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to worship Him. Some people are like, Pastor, why is the music so loud at church? It's because I want you to lift up your voice and worship with us. There are some times when the congregation does it, and you're like, man, the the, the sound out of the the speakers is just too loud. But I want you to know that the room of people is out singing the speakers. There are times where I hear you all more than I can hear the sound system. That's because we're learning to raise up our voices to God. If we can learn to raise up our voices to God in worship, then we can learn to raise up our voices to God in prayer. And I believe that many of you, you've probably been alone by yourself and you've cried out to God by yourself, but maybe you've never done that with other people around. Like a bold, I'm going to pray, it's time to talk to God, God's going to respond, I'm going to pray bold, kind of speaking with the Lord. Some people say to me, now Pastor Paul, you know God's not deaf, you don't have to scream at him, I know that. Praying with loud cries and petitions, sometimes, it's not for the Lord and his lack of hearing. It's for you and it's for me. It's for my display of faith. It's for my opportunity to obey him. Is everybody with me today? It's for my opportunity to be bold. It's for you, not for him. Because agreed, God is not deaf. Amen? So he took action and then he cried out to the Lord. He prayed a bold prayer. What makes a bold prayer? What makes a bold prayer? Boldness may be the emotion with which you pray. Some of you, man, you have been moved in your emotions and you have prayed bold prayers because you felt it. Oh, I felt it right then. I prayed a bold prayer. So sometimes it's emotional that makes your prayer bold. How many of you experienced that in your life? Yeah. Sometimes your boldness is not The emotion that you feel, it's the willingness that you show. It's the willingness that you display. I'm going to be real transparent with you right now. Is everybody listening? Everybody say transparent. There have been times as a father when I am walking past my child's room, and here's this teenager, 14, 15, 16 years old. I walk past their room, and the Lord says, go see how they're doing and pray for them. And I think to myself, they don't want me to pray for them. They want to keep watching YouTube videos. How many of you know what I'm talking about? All the moms and dads said, amen. Amen. And they said it with a slight sigh, just in case you can't hear this online right now. (laughs) They don't want to pray. They want to keep watching the YouTube video. They want to keep listening to their podcast. They are in tune with their Spotify playlist right now. And they don't want to pray. And so what does Paul do? Paul wrestles. All right. Am I willing to do what my kid might think is awkward and step in there and pray? Or am I going to be unwilling and let this opportunity pass me by? Do you see how that's about willingness? There are times when I'm with people and and I'll just be honest with you. There are some times where I know the Lord wants me to pray for somebody while they're talking to me, and I'm like, Lord, I'm so tired. I'm just ready to go home. I'm ready, I'm ready for the next thing to happen in my day on this Tuesday afternoon or on a Wednesday night or whatever it is. And the boldness that's needed in that moment is just the boldness to say, God said pray, let's pray. Just to break out and actually pray. So your willingness can be boldness. Is everybody with me today? So sometimes your boldness is simply your willingness. Sometimes your boldness may be your wording in your prayer. What do you say? So I'm called to the hospital, and they ask me to come to the ICU. And here is a person laying in a bed. They are on a ventilator. They are on a lung and heart machine. 
They have called me to meet with this family because this person is dying and the family wants someone to pray with them before they unplug all the machines. I have been in that situation lots of times. And when I walk into that room, I think to myself, Lord, I could just pray a nice, pleasant, pastoral, chaplaincy prayer and just say, Lord, would you help this family today? Or I could walk into that room and say, hey, as a pastor, I believe God for healing. And before I pray for your peace, I'd like to take a moment to pray for healing. And the wording of my prayer is, Lord, the doctors have said no hope, but I ask that you would grant us a miracle of healing in this moment. It's, the, it's not that I shouted. It's not that I cried out in a loud voice. It's not that I did anything emotional. I certainly didn't grab that person by the body and you know, shake him in some kind of violent prayer or something like that. You know what I'm saying? The, the boldness was the words that were said, not necessarily the emotion with which it was said. Is everybody with me today? Sometimes your boldness comes down to the right words that God wants you to choose when it's time to pray. So your boldness can be emotional. Your boldness can be a willingness. Your boldness can be the words that you choose, the Lord leads you to pray. And your boldness could be that you repeat a prayer over and over. Already today, in praying for a person with a need, we prayed, and then we, we stopped and we talked for a moment, and I just felt the Holy Spirit say, you just preached it, you need to pray for him again. I said, okay. I looked at him and I said, hey, we need to pray for you again. The boldness was that we're gonna pray again, because you know what? We haven't seen the miracle accomplished yet. This person had an issue with their leg. I could feel it in their leg. I'm like, you know what? Let's pray again until that feels different. Let's, let's give it another go around. So sometimes the boldness is in prayer is that you pray again because it wasn't done yet. What did Elisha do in the story? He stretched himself out on the boy. How many times? Three times. Didn't happen the first time. Can you see Elijah? He stretches himself out on the boy. He cries out to the Lord with a loud prayer. He prays this prayer, and then he, I just see, he stepped back, and he looked at the boy. He, he put his face down to hear if there was a heartbeat. He put his hand close to his mouth and his nose to see if there was breath. Nothing happened. Let's do it again. He laid on the boy a second time. The Bible says he stretched out on him three times and cried out to the Lord. Three times he prayed, and God answered on the third. I tell you, sometimes the boldness that you must cultivate is a boldness to go before the Lord again and again and again and again and again. And there are some things in your life that you're going to pray for again and again and again and again and again. Listen, if you're praying for somebody in your family to be saved, pray again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Do not lack persistence in praying for that person to be saved. People that you know that are in your family, you need to pray for them to be saved. Is everybody with me today? And you need to pray that over and over and over and over again. Boldness in prayer. Cultivate a bold prayer. I'll tell you something else. Elijah prayed a hard prayer. He didn't pray something easy. He didn't pray, oh Lord, please help her feel better in the next few days. Lord, walk with her through her grief. There's a time to pray that. He prayed a hard prayer. He prayed, Lord, raise this kid back to life. Now listen, I've prayed that prayer over people many times. Lord, they pronounced this person brain dead, but I pray that you'd raise him up. I pray that you'd heal him right now. I pray that, that when they unplug all the machines from this brain dead person, I pray that he'll come back to life. I've prayed that prayer. And I want to pray those hard prayers. I want to pray those hard prayers. But I will tell you this, there are some times that God doesn't answer those prayers the way I want them to be answered. And people are not raised from the dead. Do I believe that God can raise the dead? Yes. Do I believe he will? Yes. And in that moment, I don't want to fall back into blaming God or being mad at God, which we already talked about this morning. Is everybody with me today? But be willing in your boldness. If you're going to cultivate a bold spirit, you've got to be willing to pray the hard prayers, the difficult prayers, even when you're afraid God won't answer. 
That's cultivating boldness. God, teach me how to ask big things. And Lord, help me not to back down so that I could receive a mighty miracle when I've prayed boldly and specifically for something big. That's what I want to cultivate. And that's what I want you to cultivate in your life as well. Number three, Elijah maintained a persistent spirit. He was persistent. Three times he stretched himself out on the boy. I want to challenge you with a thought today. I want to challenge you with the idea of stretching yourself out in prayer. Uh, there's the picture of Elijah stretching himself out on the boy. He laid the boy onto the bed, and then he stretched himself out on top of the boy, and he prayed this prayer. I believe that the picture that Elijah was trying to show the Lord by stretching himself out on the boy, he was trying to say, hey, God, here's my life, here's my breath, here's my spirit. You can take me, and you can put it in that kid. Like, I'll give my life for this boy because he's all the mama has. The, this is all she has for hope of provision in her future. In those days, nobody was going to hire the widow lady to work for them. And legally, in the area of Sidon where she lived, it was illegal for her to own certain kinds of property. She probably lived in a house and, and let Elijah live with her in the upper room in a place that was borrowed. She needed that son to grow up and provide, just like the widow from Nain. Remember when Jesus was traveling along in the New Testament, and it says that as he traveled along near a little town called Nain, there was a funeral procession coming along, and there was a young man in the funeral uh, beer or in the casket that was being carried on the shoulders of some people. Jesus saw that it was the only son of a widow, and so he's put his hand on the beer and stopped the funeral procession and said, young man, get up. And that boy was raised from the dead. That was to provide for the mom. You already see the provision there? And Elijah was looking for the same thing here, that she would receive that provision. And so he stretched himself out. I want to challenge you guys today. Stretch yourself in prayer. Stretch your faith. Stretch to believe God for more. I want you to think about Elijah stretching himself out on a boy, or if it helps you, think about a shortstop. He's standing at shortstop. He's ready in an athletic position, and there's the crack of the bat. There's a line drive. It's coming off to his right. He has one split second to take a step and jump and stretch himself out until he gets a hold of that baseball. And you've seen the pictures, haven't you, where some amazing athlete He's stretched out horizontal to the ground, fully extended to grab that ball as it comes by. What has he done? He has stretched himself out to receive that ball that is coming his way. Listen, there are times where you're going to have to stretch yourself out to receive everything that God has for you, to receive the mighty miracle that God wants to give you in your life. You're going to have to stretch yourself out. And I challenge you today, stretching yourself out may be saying, you know what? I sat in my seat long enough. Today, I'm responding to the altar call. I've waited long enough. Today, I'm going to stretch my faith, and I'm going to let what someone on the prayer team pray for me. Maybe you're going to stretch your faith this week, and you're going to say, I'm going to go to the prayer team, and they're going to pray for a mighty miracle. Then I'm going to my small group, and I'm telling my small group what's going on, and I'm asking my small group to pray for a mighty miracle. I'm going to call these people that I know that were believers that always told me about Jesus before I got saved. I'm going to call them up. I'm going to let them know I'm saved. And I'm going to ask them to pray because I need a prayer team praying for me this week. Stretch yourself to receive more from God. Elijah stretched himself out on that boy, and he did it three times. Be persistent. <clears throat> thing we see is that when he received, he shouted a testimony. He said, look, your son is alive. Man, I can't imagine but that all the neighbors there in Zarephath heard Elijah crying out to God with loud cries. All the people, all those neighbors that lived around that widow's little borrowed house, they heard Elijah crying out, your son is alive, your son is alive, as he came down the steps with that boy breathing and well. I mean, there was a shout of praise in that house. Somebody say Amen. There was a shout of praise in that house on that day. Let's maintain a persistent spirit. I want to show you some pictures about being persistent. In 600 AD, in 600 AD, 
there were some monks who decided that they would go to the island of, of uh, Skellig Island. The island of Skellig. There's a picture of it on the screen today. It's about 44 acres square. It rises 750 feet out of the ocean. Skellig Island is located just southwest of England. You can show the next slide. <clears throat> I think it's a map. Down in the bottom corner of that map, you can see Skellig Michael Island, that little black square. That's where the island is located. The monks decided that they would give their lives to prayer to battle the devil. We'll give our lives to prayer to battle the devil. And they moved to this little island. You saw this rocky crag. There's not a tree on it, so there's no way for them to light a fire. The only thing they could eat were the vegetables they grew in a small garden, the fish that they caught in the ocean that they ate raw, and bird eggs that they were able to find along the cliffs occasionally, and they would eat the eggs raw. They committed their lives to living on that island. And from 600 A.D. to 1200 A.D., for 600 years, there was a group of six monks, limited to six, that would spend all of their time praying, battling the devil for the Christian world to accomplish its mission, for Christians to live for God and for Christians to share the gospel with their friends, neighbors, and nations. And all they did was pray and seek God. They prayed bold prayers, and they were determined that prayer was the way to fight the devil. To get to their little monastery, you had to walk up a set of steps that was about 650 steps from the edge of the ocean to the little beehives that they had built for themselves to live in. They, they say they're beehives because they're shaped like beehives made of stone, and this is the monastery where they lived. Generation after generation after generation of individuals would say, I'll join the six when someone else died so that we can pray and fight the devil. And for 600 years, that monastery existed with six people praying and fighting the devil. How many of you recognize that picture? What's it from? It's from Star Wars, isn't it? That place where... Ray went to meet Luke, the old Luke Skywalker. That's where they made the movie. But the reason that place exists is because for 600 years, some believers said, I'll live on raw fish and eggs the rest of my life. And you'll bury me in that little cemetery as I give my life to prayer for the kingdom of God. And then... We think we pray. We think we live a life of prayer. Whew. That'll make you say, hey, God, maybe I need to focus on prayer just a little bit more. Amen? Yeah. I want you to stand to your feet today, and I'm going to ask the musicians to come to the front. I've asked you to stretch yourself in prayer. So everybody stand to your feet. I want you to do one last thing. I've, I think I've gone just a little bit too long today, so we're going to pray rather quickly. But we want to pray for mighty miracles right now. Amen? Man, we're not going to preach like this and not pray for mighty miracles, right? I want, before, before we move, before I ask you to come to the front, I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way to the front, some of the elders and, and prayer team members. If you can make your way to the front, you're going to help us pray today. <clears throat> Stephen's coming. Tim, would you help us pray today as well? David uh, McKim, would you help us pray today? <clears throat> and let's seek the Lord. Before you move, everybody in the room, do, stretch your arms out like this. Just take a second. Stretch your arms out. I'm going to ask you yourself, to, I'm going to ask you if you'll, if, will you stretch yourself in prayer today? Will you stretch yourself in prayer today? When you stretch out like this, you are, your mind Psychologists tell us that when a person stands like this, your mind will make you more vulnerable. When you stretch yourself out to God in prayer, you will find yourself feeling vulnerable. You can put your arms down. But listen, vulnerability with God is the best place in the world to be. Vulnerability with God is the best place in the world to be. I want to challenge you today, if you've got any need, 
make your way to the front, and let's trust God for some miracles. The worship team's gonna lead us in a song. It's gonna be our closing song, and we're gonna pray for some miracles today. Some of you have a big need, and you need to bring that big need to the Lord today, and we need to trust God for some big and mighty miracles in the room today. Heavenly Father, in the next few moments, I pray.